project to build something new uh, for this century. Um, uh, okay, so also I'm also a, a member of the DSA. So my my chapter now is here in Connecticut, where I'm living. Uh, I don't know where where I'm gonna be participating next term, but that's another history. So um, in terms of the election, uh, of course, as in every election and every political landscape, it's necessary to have like some historical background of it. And uh, maybe you're aware or not, but uh, in the years, in the 70s, uh, when the crisis of the elemental state was hitting uh, Latin America, uh, one of the uh, 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 kind of like social re social revolution that took place in Latin America was the Chilean one, when uh, Salvador Allende uh, got democratically elected, being the first Marxist president, being democratically elected in the world. Um, process that was highly intense in terms of social participation. And after uh, three years of government and uh, economic crisis, that is partly explained by the own mistakes of the left in government, but also because uh, US imperialism uh, pushing for a boycott uh, to the Chilean economy, uh, got a huge backlash uh, um, and process that got into a terminal crisis with the rise of Pinochet uh, and its and its coup uh, and the uh, and the dictatorship that came thereafter. So that dictatorship was a huge, an intense process of persecution. To in, in some extent, it was like a fascist dictatorship, but with the particularity that instead of being a corporatist, corporativist, a state managed bureaucratic fascism was a neoliberal one. So uh, you might have here about the history of the Chicago Boys, or Chilean economists that were trained uh, here in the US, uh, studying with Milton Friedman and Gary Baker, among others. Um, and I got back uh, to be uh, the, in some extent, the, 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 intellect, the organic intellectuals of the dictatorship. Uh, in the particular articulation between fascism and uh, neoliberalism. Uh, um, but many times it's overlooked the violent origins of neoliberalism, but I think like you all comrades should be aware about the racial war that took place in, here in the US, uh, uh, particularly in Detroit with the huge backlash against uh, uh, the Black Panther uh, and the and the and the labor movement that was uh, that has a, a color face, uh, maybe. Where and then we can recall the killing of Fred Hampton, among other social leaders. Um, well, getting back to Chile and the dictatorship, uh, so really turbulent times. Um, and the key part of the history of the dictatorship is that uh, the revolt against the dictatorship and the process of resistance. Uh, got defeated uh, in terms of not achieving to kill Pinochet in the attempt that the Communist Party and the arm, arm <laughs> of the Communist Party did try to kill Pinochet. And after that, uh, the aftermath of the attempt to kill Pinochet in the 80, 85, 86, if I'm not wrong, uh, it derived in a democratic process to get back the, to democracy, but in the terms of the dictatorship. Uh -huh. So the period of the post-dictatorship uh, was uh, mainly defined by all the civic servants of the dictatorship that were uh, part of the massive violations against human rights in Chile, uh, remain to be part of the traditional establishment in the post-dictatorship period. Another important characteristic of the post-dictatorship period is that the progressive neoliberal coalition uh, that exclude the Communist Party, but was a big commitment between the Socialist and the Christian Democrats. Uh, Christian Democrat Party is a really strong party in Chile, or was, um, and, which is the same party of Angela Merkel, by the way, to put it on simple. Um, so <clears throat> that period was characterized by a period of, of high stability in terms of, in, you know, of high political stability. So. Uh, the, the progressive neoliberal coalition uh, achieved to have important rates of economic growth, diminished poverty, 
but sustaining high inequality. And that, uh, in some extent, regime of accumulation got depleted in the aftermath of the global crisis in 2008, when the progressive government uh, uh, was defeated by the right wing. Mm -hmm. So the right wing government of, with, of the first government of Piñera was characterized for being a more liberal right wing, trying to wash their faces from their relations with the dictatorship, but having a lot of people that was involved in the dictatorship, at least in the civil, civic uh, networks of the dictatorship being in government. So in some extent, uh, Chile never have had an important uh, persecutions against violators of human rights. There have been many cases that have been successful in that, but minoritarians. And there are packed packs of silence within the military and networks with the right wing that have protected violators of human rights systematically. And so the biggest threat to Chilean democracy, in some extent, uh, from the past, never have fed away. Uh, um, so in the aftermath of the global crisis, Chile entered in a period of relative instability with alternance of governments between uh, a, a strong presidential figures. Uh, so first, Piñera, a uh, big entrepreneur, a uh, big business uh, the owner, one of the big uh, 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 yeah, entrepreneurs of the of the of, of the Chilean economy got into power, and then he got defeated by Michel Bachelet, who was the president that was previous to him in government. And then the same Piñera came back again to government. So we had a period of Bachelet, Piñera, Bachelet, Piñera for like ten years after the the global crisis hit. And in that process, also. Uh, uh, the is when the global crisis hit Latin America more badly, like more more strongly in 2014 when Argentina and Brazil uh, get into recession. So it's a period of uh, high political instability, global stagnation of the global economy, and of course of Chile as well. Uh, and that period, to some extent, uh, uh, of relative instability. Uh, it becomes a completely political turmoil with the social explosion in 2019 when uh, the right-wing government of Piñera in his second government decided to rise uh, the price of public transportation and massive protests led by students uh, trying to uh, waive the, the, the payment and just like uh, jumping off the, the fence to get freely to to the subway and so on, with massive riots in that realm. That was kind of like the light that turned on uh, the plane lands and, and the spark that brought a big social turmoil uh, with massive riots and general strike uh, between October 18 of 2019 and uh, until like late November. Mm -hmm. uh, in late November, uh, the the progressives and the left has a big had a big divide about getting an agreement to open a path for a new constitution in the context that the Chilean constitution was imposed by the dictatorship in the 80s in a, in pretty shady terms um uh, fraudulent elections and, and, and um so there are parts of the left that were I, I, I identify myself that we were in agree of making a, uh, an agreement with the political establishment. Uh, um, and all part of the left that pushed for that agreement to open the path for a new constitution. Among those figures is Gabriel Boric, who is our uh, presidential candidate right now. And you can imagine that after that, a little bit later, the pandemic hit, the global crisis got uh, more intensified. So basically, Chile has been a political turmoil where people is pretty tired of like everything that is going on because it has been a really intense process. Uh, so uh, between uh, the social explosion, then a referendum to get a new constitution that uh, was approved by a landslide, and then uh, then having to choose the constituted assemblies, and and in that kind of process we have got into the presidential election that is going to be the last government with the previous constitution. 
where in, in all this political turmoil with the desire of many people that is tired of how so much political intensity uh, uh, of order and, uh, and kind of like bring down all these intensive political processes. And that have opened the space for a fascist or five neo fascist or neo Pinochetist candidate to rise, uh, becoming the main threat to democracy in Chile. And of course, he is uh, highly related to all the networks of the dictatorship, uh, both in the military and the civic realm. And, and in some extent, we have a, a problem of in the first round of the election uh, that the progressive candidate got in some extent uh, hilarized uh, in terms of his campaign of not going to the territories and more poor places in Chile to campaign in the first round um, and staying only in Santiago, producing in some extent a big divide between the urban uh, progressives in Santiago with the rest of the country where the fascist candidate got a good vote. So no one had an important majority in the first round. Uh, both were around 25%, but the right wing candidate got 28. So that awake, awoke, uh, made an awakening of uh, all the social forces that were in the social explosion and so on to mobilize uh, for the progressive candidate, Gabriel Boric. Um, and on the other hand, the right wing also uh, is mobilizing anti-communist uh, fears and, and portraying that the government of the progressive will be uh, characterized by being managed by the International Communist Party of China and that kind of bullshit that they always come to it. Uh, this, the candidate uh, of the right, far right, is extremely dangerous in terms of proposing cutting back women's rights, immigrant rights, uh, and all the kind of Trumpist politics that we have seen already uh, with Trump first, Bolsonaro after, and also what is happening in Eastern Europe with in Polony, in, in Polonia, I don't know how to say Poland, in Poland and Hungary, with where far right governments have, have been established. Already. So basically, what is at stake is to protect the process of the new constitution and having a new constitution built in democracy that never have been and uh, have been done in Chile in Chilean history in democratic terms. Uh, actually, I would cast doubt that that have happened. Uh, as a democratic process as, elsewhere. I don't know if there is a, a good example. So I think regardless is a process more of reform than revolution, I think that is a step forward. Uh, so it's highly necessary to have a president that here, if, if he's a more social democrat than a revolutionary, that will protect the process where the people rise to have a new constitution. Um, and also there are important progressive reforms in terms of healthcare, uh, social insurance, uh, female employment, uh, a new care system, and so on and so, and so forth, that would be important advances for the working class if they actually got materialized. So to some extent, the problem that we're in is that we have allowed a democracy with faces living in it uh, from the very beginning after the post-dictator post period started. And now we're seeing the results of uh, allowing Pinochetist politics being part of the democratic process uh, from 30 years ago until now. And yeah, I think that is kind of like a broad summary of what is going on. And happy to uh, hear questions, comments, uh, or any other information or inputs that you might add because 30 minutes is kind of like <laughs> hard to summarize everything. Uh, but also, I, I don't know everything about Chilean politics near, near global politics. So I will be happy of hearing any thoughts, comments, questions, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. So we can, yeah, so thank you, Dio. We can go ahead and take uh, questions in the chat. Um, I will ask, uh, you know, we kind of saw the same thing uh, not so long ago. Uh, people in the United States had the, had the choice at some point uh, between Trump and Bernie and um, I'm just curious, how, how close to that situation do you see uh, Chile being in? I think, in some extent, um, it is quite similar in the second round. In the first round, it was more kind of like a Hillary versus Trump landscape. 
And, and the bad results that the progressive had in the first round uh, pushed them to have important changes in the campaign and the, uh, in some extent with a double movement. On the one hand, trying to gain support with the establishment, getting more support from the center, from the political center in the establishment, in the, in the traditional politics, but also uh, bringing some social fears that have uh, gone to campaign the territories and listen what everyday people is actually living. So in some extent, there have been a movement towards the center, uh, but on the same side, uh, it had been uh, a, an important movement towards uh, 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 hearing more grassroots organization and their demands and their desires and what is going on uh, in the territories uh, all around the country. So I, I will summarize in that kind of like double movement. Um, we have a question in the chat, Karen A, um, is Boric advocating any kind of land reform measures? Uh, actually, no. Uh, one of the, so, mm, uh, it's complicated because in terms of land reform, we could consider to give the Mapuche population, that is a native community that lives in the south of Chile, to uh, acknowledge them. One of the things that probably will be an outcome of the new constitutional process uh, will be that uh, uh, to consider Chile as a plurinational state. And that will open the gates to important reparations to indigenous uh, communities. And in that realm, uh, what explains more the conflict that Mapuche communities are having the big, with big capital forestry industry in the South, where they are like fighting with guns against each other, uh, with paramilitaries from the forestry industry, the support of the police and the military from Chile, with the right-wing government, which would be an important measure of that Gabriel Boric is saying that we shouldn't militarize the, the, the Mapuche, the, the, the South of Chile where the Mapuche lives. And that will open a gate to actually have some land reform in terms of uh, indigenous communities recovering their ancestral, ancestral lands from big forests. But in terms of, uh, of agricultural development, there is no important discussion in terms of land reform. Um, and, and I think that is one of the big problems that, that, that we have actually. Um, it's something that, that we have been discussing more like the radical left circles, but uh, in the more like progressive left, it hadn't been uh, an important topic, but uh, there have been an important effort to listen what is going on everywhere in the country right now. So I guess that, that is something positive that would my raise concerns in the headquarters of the campaign about those issues. So uh, yeah, if we're positive <laughs> uh, or optimist, uh, there might arise some of those issues if we win, because yeah, we're one week away from the election, so. Uh, a question from Jorg, do you see a danger of violent response from the right if they were to win elections? What do you, like, what do you see happening? You never know. So I don't think right after the elections something will happen, but definitely if there is an important effort from the, from a new government, for example, to demilitarize what is going on in the South with the Mapuche community. Uh, probably the forestry industry will uh, rise in arms with paramilitary more strongly to fight against the Mapuche by themselves. So that might intensify the conflict there. And, and I think that the military could threat uh, the democratic process, not after the election, but maybe afterwards, if there is an important reform against, uh, in terms of the pension system or the healthcare reform, who knows what can happen? Because the, the networks of Pinochet uh, are still there, both in the political system and also in the military. So um, that is always a threat in Chile. So, uh, but when, I don't think right after the election, but who knows what could happen when the, if, if there's a progressive government doing important reforms. Right. And it was just recently revealed, he denied this for a long time, but Cass's father, right wing candidate, his father was literally a Nazi. He had like a Nazi party. Yeah, it was literally a Nazi, and he also like there are pictures of him uh, with as a Nazi boy, boy scout, uh, uh, because he had denied that, and that like he he said that his father was only a soldier in the Nazi army, but uh, it had been on top that it was completely alive. 
Okay, well, we are out of time. Thank you, Diego, for talking to us and um, letting us know the situation that Chile is currently in.